Hello. I miss all of you so much. So in processing how to get ready for Palm Sunday, one of my thoughts was, how could I make this a unique worship experience? Um, I have sung a few songs and I've put them on YouTube and I'll send those links out, but just me alone, I can't really, um, I didn't know how to make this unique and special from my other videos. So the Lord came upon me and I had an idea. I have this book. It is a Lenten study. It is called The Last Week, What the Gospels Really Teach About Jesus' Final Days in Jerusalem. And it's by Marcus Borg and John Dominique Croissant. And I love this book. So one thought I had was that we would journey each day all the way to Easter. Now the chapters are quite long, so of course I won't read them all to you, but I've gone through and highlighted and marked out the pieces and parts that I wish to share throughout this book. So it'll be a bit of a reading. I may interject now and then with some commentary and candor, but um, let's proceed. So to start this off again, we are in Palm Sunday today. The scripture I'm going to read from is Mark 11 verses 1 through 11. You ready? When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in those fields. Then those who went ahead and those followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. I absolutely love that I work for Bethany Presbyterian Church at such a time as Easter when so much is happening in Bethany. So the chapter begins. Two processions entered Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. It was the beginning of the week of Passover, the most sacred week of the Jewish year. In the centuries since, Christians have celebrated this day as Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week. With its climax of Good Friday and Easter, it is the most sacred week of the Christian year. So of these two processions, one is a peasant procession and the other is an imperial procession. From the east, Jesus rode on a donkey down the Mount of Olives, cheered by his followers. Jesus was from the peasant village of Nazareth. His message was about the kingdom of God and his followers came from the peasant class. They had journeyed to Jerusalem from Galilee about 100 miles to the north, a journey that is central section to the central dynamic of Mark's gospel. Mark's story of Jesus and the kingdom of God has become been aiming for Jerusalem, pointing towards Jerusalem. It has now arrived. Now on the opposite side of the city, from the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, enters Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God Pilots proclaimed the power of empire. The two processions embodied the central conflict of the week that led to Jesus' crucifixion. Pilate's military procession was a demonstration of both Roman imperial power and Roman imperial theology. Though unfamiliar to most people today, the imperial procession was well known in the Jewish homeland in the first century. Mark and the community for which he wrote would have known about it. 
for it was just the standard practice of the Roman government. They did so not of, out of empathic reverence for the religious devotion of their Jewish subjects, but to be in the city in case there was any trouble. There often was, especially at Passover, a festival that celebrated the Jewish people's liberation from an entire empire. The mission of the troops with Pilate was to reinforce the Roman garrison permanently stationed at the fortress Antonia, overlooking the Jewish temple and its courts. They had Pilate had come up from Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea on the sea, which I've been there, about 60 miles to the west. Like the Roman governors of Judea and Samaria before and after him, Pilate lived in the splendid city on the coast. For them, it was much more pleasant than Jerusalem, the traditional capital of the Jewish people, which was inland and insecular, providential and partisan and often hostile. Imagine the imperial procession's arrival in the city, a visual panophy of imperial power, cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather belts and poles glinting in the sun with metal and gold. Pilate's procession displayed not only an imperial power, but a Roman imperial theology. You see, according to this theology, the emperor was not simply the ruler of Rome, but the son of God. So we return to the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem. Although it is familiar, it has surprises. As Mark tells the story in 11, 1 through 11, it is a prearranged counter procession. Jesus had planned it in advance. As Jesus approaches the city from the east, at the end of the journey from Galilee, he tells two of his disciples to go to the village and get him a colt. They do, and Jesus rides the colt down the Mount of Olives to the city, surrounded by a crowd of enthusiastic followers and sympathizers who spread their cloaks and shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The meaning of this demonstration is clear. It is for using, using the symbolism from the prophet Zechariah in the Jewish Bible. According to Zechariah, a king would be coming to Jerusalem, Zion, humble and riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In Mark, the reference to Zechariah is implicit. Matthew, when he treats Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, makes the connection explicit by quoting the passage, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal. The rest of the Zechariah passage details what kind of king he will be. It reads, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall command peace to the nations. Jerusalem at that time was just not any city. By the first century, it had been the center of a sacred geography of the Jewish people for a millennium. And ever since, it has been central to the sacred Im imagination of both Jews and Christians. Its associations are both positive and negative. It is the city of God and the faithless city, the city of hope and the city of oppression, the city of joy and the city of pain. Jerusalem had become the ancient capital of Israel in the time of King David around 1000 BCE. Under David and his son Solomon, Israel experienced the greatest, his, the greatest period in history. The country was united, all 12 tribes under one king. It was at its largest, it was powerful, and thus its people were safe from marauding neighbors. A glorious temple was built by Solomon in Jerusalem David's reign in particular was seen not only as a time of power and glory, but also of justice and righteousness in the land. David was the just and righteous king. He became associated with goodness, power, protection, and justice. He was the ideal shepherd king, the apple of God's eye, even God's son. I'm going to skip forward just a wee bit. In Mark and in the other Gospels, Jesus never goes to a city except Jerusalem, of course. Though the first half of Mark is set in Galilee, Mark does not report that Jesus went to its largest cities. Even though the first is only four miles from Nazareth, and the second is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Instead, Jesus speaks in the countryside, 
and then small towns like Capernaum or Bethany? The most compelling answer is that Jesus saw his message as two and four those people. According to Mark, Jesus' message and activity immediately involved him in conflict with authorities. Chapters 2 and 3 contain a series of conflict stories. His opponents are named as scribes, Pharisees, Herodians. Near the end of these stories, the first explicit reference to Jerusalem occurs. Scribes who came down from Jerusalem accuse Jesus of being possessed. He has Beelzebub and the ruler of the demons. He casts out the demons. Jerusalem becomes a central in the section of Mark that tells the story of Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. It begins roughly through Mark with Peter's affirmation that Jesus is the Messiah. The next two and a half chapters leading to Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday are what it means to follow Jesus to be a genuine disciple. Mark develops this theme by weaving together several sub-themes. You ready? Following Jesus means following him on the way. The way leads to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place of confrontation with the authorities. Jerusalem is the place of death and resurrection. Immediately after Mark reports Peter's affirmation that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus for the first time speaks of his destiny. He is going to Jerusalem where he will be executed by the authorities. Then Jesus begins to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days he will rise again. Commonly called the first prediction of the Passion, it is followed by two more solemn announcements. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. A chapter later, it sounds for a third time, Jesus and his followers were on the road, on the way, going to Jerusalem. Jesus says, see, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. The temple authorities here spoke of as chief priests and scribes will hand Jesus over to the Gentiles. That is to the imperial, imperial Roman authorities and they will kill him. Each of these anticipations of Jesus' execution is followed by teaching what it means to follow Jesus. After the first address to both disciples and the crowd, the Jesus of Mark says, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In first century Christianity, the cross had twofold meaning. On the one hand, it represented execution by the empire. Only the empire crucified, and then for only one crime, denial of imperial authority. The cross had not yet become a, symbolized, a symbol for suffering as it is today. When one's illness or other hardship can be spoken of as the cross I've been given to bear, rather it meant risking imperial retribution. On the other hand, the cross by the time of Mark's gospel had also become a symbol for the way or the path of death and resurrection, of entering new life by dying to an old life. The cross as the way of transformation is found in Paul. It is also present in Mark. Indeed, in case we might miss the point, Luke adds to the daily words in Mark's passage about taking up the cross to make sure that we understand that the way of the cross is a path of personal transformation. After the second passage anticipating Jesus' execution in Jerusalem, Mark reports that Jesus asked his disciples, what are you arguing about on the way? Learning that they have been arguing about who among them was the greatest, he says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. The contrast of first and last correlates with another paradoxical contrast in this teaching of Jesus. 
Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who puff themselves up, make something great of themselves, will be humiliated, and those who humble themselves, who make themselves empty, will be filled, exalted. This is the way of following Jesus. The third anticipation of Jesus' execution, the longest and most detailed, is followed by the longest and most detailed exposition of what it means to follow Jesus. James and John, two of the inner circle of his followers, ask for places of honor in the kingdom they believe is coming. Jesus responds, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized by the baptism I am baptized? Both cup and baptisms are images of death. Later in Mark, when Jesus faces his own death, he speaks of it as his cup. And baptism in early Christianity was seen as a ritual enactment of dying and rising. And Jesus's question means, are you willing to follow me on the path of death and resurrection? The passage continues after the cup and baptism images. The Jesus of Mark says, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them, but it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave to all. The domination system here described as being of the Gentiles, in which rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them, shall not be so among those who follow Jesus. To underline the centrality of these chapters that speak of what it means to follow Jesus, Mark frames them in two stories of seeing of blind men regaining their sight through Jesus. At the beginning, right before Peter's affirmation at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus lays hands on a blind man and his sight is restored and he sees clearly. At the end, as Jesus passes through Jericho and nears Jerusalem, Bartimaeus, the blind beggar, beseeches Jesus, my teacher, let me see again. Then Mark tells us immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. The framing is deliberate, the meaning clear. To see means to see that the way involves following Jesus to Jerusalem. Thus we have the twofold theme that leads to Palm Sunday. Genuine discipleship, following Jesus, means to follow him to Jerusalem, the place of confrontation, with the domination system, and two, the death and resurrection. These are two themes of the week that follows in the Holy Week. Indeed, these are two themes of Lent and of the Christian life. As we conquer or conclude this chapter, we conquered the chapter, conclude this chapter and the two processions that begin the Holy Week, we want to guard against some possible misunderstandings of the conflict that led to Jesus's crucifixion. It was not Jesus against Judaism. Much of the scholarship of the last half century, especially the last 20 years, has rightly emphasized that we must understand Jesus within Judaism, not against Judaism. Much of the scholarship of the last half century, especially the last 20 years, yes, I'm repeating myself, has rightly emphasized that we must understand Jesus within Judaism, not against Judaism. Jesus was a part of Judaism, not apart from Judaism. The conflict is not about priests and sacrifice, as if Jesus's primary passion was a protest against the role of priestly meditations or against animal sacrifice. Rather, his protest was against a domination system legitimated in the name of God, a domination system radically different from what the already present and coming kingdom of God, the dream of God, would be like. It was not Jesus against Judaism or Judaism against Jesus. Rather, his was a Jewish voice, one of several first century Jewish voices, 
about what loyalty to the God of Judaism meant. And for Christians, he is the decisive Jewish voice. Two processions enter Jerusalem on today, on Palm Sunday. The same question, the same alternative faces those who would be faithful to Jesus today. Which procession are we in? Which procession do we want to be in? This is the question of Palm Sunday and of about the what <laughs> and of the week that is about to unfold. Are you excited? I hope so. I would like to take a moment now to pray. So that was the first chapter, and we will move on tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and learn more as we journey with Jesus to Easter. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Loving God, you are our creator and sustainer. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. And so we look to you whenever we are in need, trusting in your love and your abundant goodness. As you once fed the hungry crowds with five loaves and two small fish, we ask that you would again fill those who are empty this day. Pour out your spirit on all who hunger and thirst. We pray for those who are physically hungry, whose stomachs are empty. We think of the people around the world who are facing critical food shortages, who've lost their jobs, due to pandemic, who are suffering the effects of poverty and helplessly watching as loved ones become sick or die. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that we all may be filled. We pray for those who are emotionally empty, who are lonely and long for companionship and love, who are caught in the grip of depression or overwhelmed with grief and anxiety. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, Pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. We pray for those who are spiritually empty, who are troubled, who don't know where to turn, who long for purpose and meaning but don't know where to look, who need you but do not know, not yet know you. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that they may be filled. God, we praise you for your abundant gifts in our lives. Pour out your spirit on us as well. Fill us with your compassion and love so that we would be willing to share some of our abundance with those who have need. Lord, in your mercy, open your hand, pour out your spirit so that we may be filled. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ who came so that all of humanity may come to know the abundant life that comes from you. And we say all of this using the prayer that you've taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ha! Ah. I have a song. You ready for that? <laughs> I want to leave you with something in your head. A tune. <sighs> I wonder how everyone has been doing. Mark. There we go. Ready? Sing with me so I don't sound so alone. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, what about one more verse and Lord haste the day 
When the faith shall be, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Amen. I miss you all. I hope you have a great week. I will send out the video on Facebook and maybe it can get emailed around as we progress through this holy week. Go in peace. If you need to call me, you have my number. If you need to email me, you could get that from Evelyn as well. Amen.